backed by evidence. Bring some of the latest findings regarding this subject. That refuses to be quiet. After all, it isn't what NASA originally said. And some people should get their money back. Andrew runs www.checktheevidence.com. Unfortunately, some of us are. Thanks to the perseverance of truth seekers like Andrew. Please welcome Andrew Johnson. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, hopefully the mic's working. It sounds to be working. Um, I might move around for this first part, James, um, slightly. Uh, I'd like to thank James and Jenny for inviting me back uh, to do another talk. And uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming, uh, and that, particularly those that have come a long distance. So thank you very much. I'll just start off by making a couple of brief uh, sort of announcements, as it were. Um, I've got some booklets and DVDs, uh, as I always bring with me for those that have seen me speak here before. This is 50 pence, booklets 30 pence. Um, and I've also brought with me something else which is rather special. Uh, some of you will know my involvement with a person called Dr. Judy Wood, who's done the only uh, credible research into 9-11, certainly as far as the physical evidence of what happened at the World Trade Center. After a long, hard struggle, and uh, several tens of thousands of miles journey from the Far East, I have in my hands a 500-page, full-color book, which uh, is, is the only book about 9-11 written by a qualified scientist, which will explain to you in very graphic and very great detail how the World Trade Center was destroyed using some type of energy weapon, and the technology of that energy weapon is also known about, it's similar to something called the Hudson Effect. Uh, there are now uh, uh, 100, 200 copies sitting in London at the docks, which are, we've had shipped across the Atlantic. This book isn't cheap, because as you can see, it's a very high quality text. I brought it with me today, not for sale, but for those that want to look at it, it will be available in the interval for you to have a look at. It is available. I've got some flyers, so you can get, get it from the website. As I say, I'm hoping to get hold of some copies, and I'll probably have quite decided how we're going to... Um, ship it through the website and whatnot because of the payment and this sort of thing, but it will be made available. It is making an impact. We have a professor of English called Eric Larson, a US-based professor. He has already described it as the most important book of the 21st century, and I agree with him. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous book indeed, not only for um, the mainstream media and all that, but it's also a very dangerous book for the 9-11 Truth Movement. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the world. Nobody will talk about this book. So if you want to have a look at it and see, get a glimpse of why that is the case, it's here for you to look at. What's the likely price, Andrew? Um, the, the, the US price is 39.95 plus shipping. So it's on par with a you know, university type textbook. We haven't worked out the UK price yet because it depends on what sort of uh, shipping deals we can get. It weighs three pounds. So that puts it into a high uh, postage rate, which is a bit of a problem for, for me. So we've got to work out what's the cheapest way to do it and that sort of thing. But the uh, US price is 39.95 plus to the UK uh, 13.95 shipping, because it's expensive to get a heavy object shipped like that uh, from, the, from the US. So, so that's basically that. Um, so anyway, on we, on we go into the main presentation after a little mini featurette, and we'll, we'll see where we get to. Here we go. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you we say we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. So now you know where I got the title for this presentation from, from Neil Armstrong himself. In this presentation we will examine a range of ev different evidence which seems to show that much of what we were told and shown about the Apollo moonshot program was false or fake. We will look at likely motives for the fakery, which a lot of people don't go into that much. We'll look at some aspects of Apollo history initially. Photographic evidence, I, don't, I haven't done a, lot, a great deal of that all this thing about the shadows, there's a lot of controversy in that, and I don't think you can decide a lot of that 
one way or the other, but I've got some photo evidence which I think is much more compelling than just the issue of the shadows. I've got some video evidence which you may not have seen before. We're going to look at what the astronauts themselves have said. This is something that's undeniable. And they have said some very, very interesting things about what happened to them on the Apollo missions. We're also going to look at some new evidence from this new probe called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was launched, I think, in either 2008 or 2009. And there were some pictures published uh, from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter when it went over the Apollo landing sites in 2009. I think it was August 2009, but I've got that later in the presentation. Uh, and, how, and we'll look at how could they possibly have got away with it. Uh, the researchers we must thank are these people, there are, there are several others, but these are the prominent researchers which I've pulled a lot of the information from, uh, and I've added just a little bit, probably, you know, five or six percent in this presentation is my, my research, and most of it's come from these people. Bill Casing is now deceased, Jim Collier, who was a journalist, Bill Casing worked for a company called Rocketdyne, which was involved in the Apollo development, uh, Bart Sabrell, uh, he's a kind of controversial figure. He's a sort of some type of fundamentalist Christian as well, which seems to colour his some of his research. Um, but uh, he did a bloody good job on uh, some of the films that he made, and I've got some clips of those, which are a bit difficult to watch actually. But uh, uh, he he did a, some great research. Uh, and David Percy and Mary Bennett uh, have also done written a book called Dark Moon. It's probably a um, Oh, I shouldn't know the date, but I think it was published in the 90s. It's, it's, it's not new. And also Ralph René, who's kind of one of these rebel thinkers. He's, he also passed away a, a couple of years ago, I think. Um, so those are the people we've got to thank for, for, for primarily for getting this information out. But, you know, one of the questions I'm asked when I talk about this is how could they possibly have got away with faking, faking something like this? And most people cannot believe that they could possibly have got away with faking this, and they will therefore reject anything else that you tell them out of hand, because I think there's no way they could have, they could have faked this. Um, too many people would have a chance to find out about the hoax. That's one of the things that they say, you know, would be impossible to, 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 to hoax that There's too many people involved. Well, it kind of assumes that the whole program was faked. In other words, you know, they never built the Apollo rocket, they never built mission control. Of course, that's not true. Of course, they built Apollo rockets. Of course, they built uh, mission control, etc. Only parts of the Apollo program were faked. Of course, there were real people from the army involved in this sort of thing. Now, I think most researchers, as far as I can tell, they would agree that the Apollo, Apollo rockets were real and they took off. I think we can agree on that. There's certain questions about the performance of these rockets that some people ask, like if you watch the Saturn V going up, for example, it's a very, very smoky flame and I've read something that they think that that was done to make it look more spectacular. And the actual performance of the rocket, did, you know, it wouldn't really necessarily give off a lot of smoke because that would mean it wasn't efficient or something. Um, and my, bet, my current understanding is I think the capsules took astronauts into orbit. Now, there's, again, there's arguments over this, but I believe that the ast astronauts were taken into orbit on most of the missions. And they, but they stay, I believe they stayed in Earth orbit. Again, once you get into this, it become, that becomes very difficult. But with this in mind, much, much of the effort in the programme was taken up with the work in these two areas. As with the 1960s technology, it was still a difficulty. What I mean is that just to get somebody off the ground safely and into orbit was, was pretty damn tricky. And to get them to the moon was obviously just a bit of trickiness on top of that. So, you know, they, 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 they could still have done a genuine space program, but not gone to the moon, and you would have had most of the furnishings, most of the technology there, right? So it's not as if the whole thing was completely fake, which is often, you know, an implicit assumption that which is made. So in essence, once the capsule was aloft, the only source of uh, video and photo information was NASA. So providing that you could control those video feeds and photographic information, you could control entirely what people saw on the ground. And you only perhaps maybe had... A, 50 or 100 people, perhaps, at a guess, who would know that it was being faked. Um, and only NASA was communicating with the astronauts directly. There were a few people listening in, but obviously there wasn't a two-way communications path. Most people at NASA would never have considered that they were involved in something which was being hoaxed. They would never question what was on screen in front of them. In fact, if you looked at a screen in front of you showing you know, the output of the rocket or the current sort of force of gravity on the capsule or something, or whatever the read-off was, 
you wouldn't know whether you were looking at something that was real or from a simulation, quite frankly. So bear that in mind. But now we're going to look at some aspects of Apollo history. Uh, and I've got a couple of video clips here from V2 to Saturn V. Remember the V2 rockets was how this all started in the Second World War, and the Doodleborg and all that. Uh, let's see, I've got uh, some clips somewhere here. Right. But yes, we've all heard about the paperclip conspiracy. I watched a BBC Horizon programme, I think in about 1982, something like that. It was called the Paperclip Conspiracy. And it brought forward the information that most of the NASA rocket scientists were brought over from Germany, from NASA Germany, from the V2 programme. Um, so if you're importing Nazi rocket, rocket scientists into the US American rocket programme, uh, was this a healthy pedigree, do you think? Were these people trustworthy? Now, there's a very interesting clip here. Uh, let's see, I think I might have this in the video, but I'll... Let's see. Under Adolf Hitler's leadership, a Nazi war criminal named Werner von Braun built thousands of V-2 rockets through slave labor that were launched against London. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Some have harsh words for this man of renown, but some think our attitude should be one of gratitude. After the war, the Soviets and the Americans divided up the rocket technology. The Americans brought home over 100 top Nazi propulsion specialists, including their leading rocket scientist, von Braun. Since most people wanted to come live in America, the Soviet Union was given most of the hardware, which, to a large degree, contributed to their victory with Sputnik. By 1961, Nazi rocket scientists such as von Braun maintained a close relationship with President John F. Kennedy as he moved to fulfill his promise to land Americans on the moon before the end of 1969. Yet today, NASA says it will be 2018 before we go back to the moon despite having supposedly been there over 35 years ago. In 1953, Von Braun wrote a book on how to get to the moon, titled Conquest of the Moon. On page 14 of his book, he states, It is commonly believed that man will fly directly from the Earth to the moon, but to do this, we would require a vehicle of such gigantic proportions that it would prove an economic impossibility. It would have to develop sufficient speed to penetrate the atmosphere and overcome the Earth's gravity, and, having traveled all the way to the moon, it must still have enough fuel to land safely and make the return trip to Earth. Furthermore, in order to give the expedition a margin of safety, we would not use one ship alone, but a minimum of three. Calculations have been carefully worked out on the type of vehicle we would need for the non-stop flight from the Earth to the moon in return. The figures speak for themselves. Each rocket ship would be taller than New York's Empire State Building, 1,250 feet, and weigh about 10 times the tonnage of the Queen Mary, or some 800,000 tons. The Apollo program's three-stage Saturn V was only 3,000 tons. The Saturn V was 266 times smaller than it had to be. So they have one of the most well-known Nazi rocket scientists saying that they'd need a rocket as big as the Empire State Building to get to the moon. So how did they manage to do it with one that was, well, I can't remember the figure now, 20 times smaller? So you already there are question marks from one of the main, I mean, if it was just some, you know, journalist commentator, but this is von Braun, the rocket expert, who said this. So, um... Anyway, we had the, we had the various uh, Earth-orbiting programs such as uh, Gemini and Mercury involving people like Gordon Cooper and um, Ed White and all these other people. But then they started the Apollo program, and uh, it was actually this guy, who you may have heard the story of, Gus Grissom, who was meant to be the, the first man on the moon. And uh, he was regarded as a, a, loose, a loose cannon, and he had first-hand knowledge of the space program was in shambles, uh, and there's no telling what he might say to the media. This is a, a, um, a quote from one of these web pages here. Um, and if they were aware that putting a man on the moon by 1969 was impossible, he could expose the entire Apollo program as a sham, a PR stunt. And I've got some footage here from Apollo Zero, which I'll play in a minute. Uh, let's see. 
In, on January 22nd, 1967, Grissom made a brief stop at home before returning to the Cape. A citrus tree grew in their backyard with lemons on it as big as grapefruits. Gus yanked the largest lemon he could find off the tree. Betty, that's his wife, had no idea what he was up to and asked him what he planned to do with it. I'm going to hang it on the spacecraft, Gus said, and f grimly kissed her goodbye. Uh, let's see, and I think I've got this clip now. Leading astronaut of the day, Gus Grissom, was slated to be the first man to walk on the moon. He was an outspoken man with the highest level of integrity. There was no way he would lie for anyone. He was also an outspoken critic of the dilapidated state of the moon program. Just before he died, he hung a lemon on the capsule and held a press conference in which he pointed out the sad state of the program. On the morning he died, upon having difficulty communicating from the capsule, he angrily asked, Hey, how are you going to get the moon? We can't talk between three buildings. In 1967, during a plugs-out test in which no engines were even ignited, they had him in a sealed capsule and pressurized it with 100% pure oxygen. A fire erupted, and all three astronauts perished. After this grisly incident, no other astronaut dared to criticize the program. And after all these years of lying and making their livings off the fame, none chooses to wreck this acclaimed success for the others by telling the truth. There is strong reason to doubt the fire was accidental. Page 81 of the Apollo 1 Accident Investigation Report, issued by the U.S. Congress, reveals that prior to the fire, NASA, by their own admission, were very well aware of the respective fires at the Johnsville Navy Air Station and Brooks Air Force Base. The fires in question, as pointed out by author Ralph Rene, were a result of sparks and even static electricity igniting the pure oxygen environments. In spite of these past fatalities, NASA used a 100% oxygen atmosphere in the Apollo 1 spacecraft, arguing that they had done it previously on the Gemini program. Of course they had. However, Gemini had a cabin pressure of only 3 pounds per square inch, the pure oxygen equivalent to the 14.7 pounds of nitrogen and oxygen at sea level. All previous aviation flash fires had been only slightly higher than Gemini's cabin pressure. Apollo 1's cabin pressure was more than five times higher. NASA was aware of the dangers, but they went ahead and sealed three of their astronauts inside a highly volatile capsule that had already been packed full of combustible and highly toxic materials, most of which were untested and had not been given their seal of approval before they were installed. The technicians on Pad 34 needed at least five minutes to open the command capsule's door. The astronauts had a mere 15 seconds before the fire consumed their cabin. Fire! We have fire, Captain! Additionally, in 1999, when Grissom's son, Scott, was granted access to his father's spacecraft, he uncovered evidence that a metal plate had been shoved behind the dashboard to deliberately trigger a spark. Keep in mind that many of these scientists were war criminals imported from Hitler's Germany. One should not be surprised that such horrors could occur when one considers that these Nazis helped perpetuate the cruelest, most brutal atrocity that has ever taken place in the history of mankind. Uh, footage, the two clips I've used there are from a film called Apollo Zero, which is available free online. So we've got a pretty um, sordid history already. People that criticise the programme are basically killed. And they've got German rocket scientists behind it. So we're not in good shape. <laughs> OK, well, so supposedly they went aloft, they went to the moon. And what did they fi find there? Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, a lot of people just talk about the shadows. And they'll sort of make various arguments about shadows on the Apollo, uh, you know, the Apollo craft on the surface and this sort of thing. Uh, and some of those are not, in my experience, are not valid. You can't really argue with them one way or the other because you don't know the precise conditions. Um, but then there's a more obvious ones like this. We're told that there's almost no water on the moon. They, they, again, they claim to have found some recently at the, in the polar regions with these various uh, probes that have, that have gone there. But again, I've made this point about pictures from Mars. If there is no surface moisture, how can you possibly get a picture like this?
I mean, you, you, you know, you, you, can't, you can't get a picture like that without moisture because the, the dust particles bind together with the moisture. To me, that is, that is made on an artificial set. And an, another obvious point, uh, can, we, can we be really sure that this was taken with a chest-mounted camera? Because remember, the Apollo... So you think of bending down like that, and that looks as if the camera is... I suppose it could be zoomed in and whatnot. Maybe that's not such a good argument, but, you know, I have my doubts as to whether simply... Uh, the angle that that shot is taken at could have been taken by a chest-mounted camera. I would, I would just take that simple observation and consider it. But there's much more than that. Um, one of the things that really intrigued me when I first saw it in a documentary was this, where this sort of serious problem that we've got. And I've got a, I made a, an overlay clip here. This is from uh, the uh, uh, Orlis site, which is David Percy's site. Um, David Percy is a, a member of the Royal Pho Photographic Society, so he does know a lot about photography. Uh, he's, he's taken pictures of, uh, I think I've got a clip of him as well, but he's taken pictures of famous people, you know. Um, but he's got this web page up. Serious problems in the Valley of Taurus Littro. Uh, these two composite photos that are from Apollo 17 mission, the Apollo 17 mission, have been posted at allis.com. They compare two sets of two images uh, I won't read out the numbers, but those are the official numbers if you want to find the original images, and I checked them, and they are there. Uh, he splits this image in half. Um, oh, I, sorry, he basically, this, this image is a composite of two images, and this one is a composite of two images, right? So we've got four in total. Now, uh, and then he made uh, this, this, one, this one here. So what I did was I split these two from his site, uh, and then I made an, an overlay with these two images, so you can see this, and I rotated this, by one degree to get this to, so you can see this, and you'll see. Now you can see that the similar or same shadow angles of the astronaut and the LEM seem to rule out it's taken at two different locations. So we've got the astronaut's shadow there and the LEM shadow there. You watch this. Let's see if this clip will play. Oh look, the lunar module's moved. Nothing else has. How did that happen? Remember, they're supposed to have landed in completely different locations. This is a bit of a problem. This is much more damning to me than shadows ever were. There's the lunar module. No, it isn't. Uh, there's the lunar module. Which is it, NASA? And there are, there are several instances like this. That disproves the whole thing right there. I mean, I, I think I've just finished now. I'm going and... You know, say James, you give me the money, I've done my job. <laughs> but uh, there, there are several like this. You know, we've got to thank David Percy. So that, to me, forget the shadows. Just look at those sorts of things. What about the length of the shadows? Well, that will depend on the height of the lighting rig and how far back the lighting is away from the stage. So, you know, all these shadow lengths, this sort of thing. I mean, look at it. I, all I did was rotate this picture by one degree and overlaid them. There is no difference in the background. There's none. All you can see is, I think there's a line there where the lem is. And I think just about, they've moved a few rocks around in the background. You, know, you can spend a few minutes looking at it. You can see they've moved, moved a few rocks around. But this whole backdrop is, is identical. The identical is no difference at all. At all. So we'll move on. Now these, these when I've, I hadn't heard of these before, these are much more damning than shadows. Trackless rover pictures. How can the rover move without making tracks in the dust? Well, apparently it can. Here we have three pictures, or pictures with tracks in the wrong direction. There should be tracks of this thing turning around. It said it looks like it's been dumped there. This one has no tracks surrounding it. This has no tracks surrounding it. Where are the rover tracks, NASA? What have you done with them? You just have it on a crane and drop it into the set? I don't know what they did, or did you have a rake and rake over the tracks. Much more damning than shadows to me, that is. I don't know about you. And there's the image. These are all, you know, that they're, they're NASA.gov. NASA.gov. NASA these are all from there. They're, they're not like from dodgy websites. These are all original source pictures, folks. Oh, now this one. I, I mentioned this to somebody in the internet. This is my own one. Now this, when I saw this, I came across this a couple of years ago. That is just brilliant. That is genius. Genius simple. Genius simple. Nothing to do with shadows. The impossible family photo of astronaut Charlie Duke. Nice little you know, American apple pie family, you know. I mean, 
With an average surface temperature of over 100 degrees centigrade on the moon's surface in daylight, the photo would curl up almost immediately. I thought I'd test this. So um, here we have a uh, family photograph. And uh, over here we have an oven. And uh, this oven is set to 100 degrees centigrade. And I'm now going to put this photograph in the oven. She's cooking some of my dinner. And then I'm going to watch it through the glass. And that you can see that in very short order, trying to get better light, but you'll see it when I open it. This is curling up within seconds. So I think that's a pretty convincing demonstration. And here it is. You can see it there curled up and that's only at 100 degrees centigrade. So that right there disproves that that was on a real lunar surface. Because if it was, it would have wrinkled up. Simple. Notice how I was being energy efficient there, because I was actually cooking my dinner at the same time. <laughs> Didn't want to waste electricity on this, you know. I wouldn't waste electricity on NASA, you know. So um, I just I did mention, uh, you know, would like to mention the shadow analysis, because this is where you get into these dodge areas. To me, there's, you cannot dispute that. That previous one is indisputable. You cannot argue with it. With this, I think you can, to at least to some extent. Um, much has been made of a not, and this is this whole thing where you get into this disinformation. You get all these conspiracy theorists, you know, piling on, you know, saying, oh, but the, the, the actual evidence is not that good. It's, it's okay, but often it's, 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 it is, it's not incontrovertible, it is controvertible. And this is one of those examples. Uh, the argument is that with this photograph, that Aldrin is well illuminated, even though he is completely in the shadow of the lens. So if you look at the angle of the shadow, the sun is, you know, over on the right hand side of where we're looking from it. And you shouldn't be able to see him. He should be completely in shadow. Um, it's therefore argued by some that another light source or reflector must have been used. In other words, you've seen maybe when they're filming some of these shots, they have a big white board and they reflect the sunlight onto somebody so that they're not in, you, know, you can't see it. Because normally, other than that, you wouldn't be able to see their face. Um, now, there may be cases where this is correct. I'm not sure. But I, I came across a very interesting, uh, uh, this guy, Thomas Bond. He had a nice little web page. And he did a nice little experiment. This is what I like, you know, like I did with the oven. He did something like this with... Uh, 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 here we go. I tried my lighting experiments on a surface of black asphalt. This was a tennis court, I believe he did this on. Uh, for this experiment, I went to my local auto supply store and bought a new toy, a handheld floodlight, one million candle power. I took it to a tennis court late at night and hung it from the fence so it was pointing down at the same... Uh, sorry, at some common household objects. The idea was to simulate the sun on the moon... I would shine the floodlight on the, on the backs of these objects and see whether I could see their fronts. Dead easy, great stuff. That's what I like. And this is what he got. So here's, here's some of his photographs. You can see inside the can. Uh, you can see the label and all this. And he's got a whole page about this. So I think that that is controvertible evidence. Maybe, that, that was, uh, maybe this was using a, an illumination plate. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just reflection off the spacesuit or something, you could argue that. You know, the spacesuits were all white, so maybe that whole diffused light was coming off whoever's spacesuit. So you can argue that one, you know, and I would argue it. Because, you know, it doesn't meet my standards of evidence. Um, anyway, I wrote to this guy, and I, I think I, I, I don't know, I sent him the oven one. I wrote to this guy about some of the other stuff that I've got in this presentation, and uh, he never wrote back. Uh, there was another photo, I think, on this website. Now, this is where we get into this, how you keep coming across the same people, you know, in, in these areas of research. Now, there's this chap called Jack White. Now, he had a big photo series published, I think, in one of these, uh, which magazine was it? I can't remember which it was. It might have been UFO magazine when that was still going with, um, with uh, Graham Birtle. Jack White has worked with Jim Fetzer, though, who I've, his features heavily in my book. Uh, and Jack White used a lot of Dr. Judy Wood's photographs about 9-11 uh, without crediting her. But Jack White has also done a photo study, including some of the examples that I've just shown you about the shadows, which I think is dodgy. You, can't, you can argue that both ways. 
But well, the, the thing that I found on his website was uh, this, this picture. Um, and he, there was a reference for it, but I couldn't find this picture in any of the NASA archives for some reason. I'm not sure why. When I looked for this picture, which is a trackless rover picture again, which is valid, but this particular one that he used, I couldn't find a reference for it, which is a bit odd. Um, so that's just a sort of footnote to this. So this Jack White, I think he's done, he's, a, he's basically a disinfo guy. Jack, if you see Jack White in Apollo photographs, treat with care. Some of it's okay, some of it's, some of it's not correct. And the, people, the, the skeptics will pick on the stuff that's not correct and use it to discredit the genuine research. That's the way it works. That's why I highlight that. So Jack White, if you come across that, dodgy stuff. Dodgy stuff. Let's see. Right then. Now I got asked a few years ago um, by a friend of mine, oh, Hubble Space Telescope, that's a pretty mega instrument. Costs, you know, $2 billion, or whatever it costs. That must be able to see the Apollo artifacts on the moon. Surely it must be. It can see all those supernovae and, and the planetary nebulae and stars exploding, all those wonderful things that we've seen. Brilliant stuff. You know, I love it. I mean, I really love that stuff. I can't criticise that. Even though they do actually fake those images. Because they, they, they set all the colours themselves. They're not natural colours. And of course they take with long exposures and stuff like this, so you wouldn't be able to see it with your naked eye anyway. Um, so, can the Hubble telescope see the Apollo craft on the moon? Well, I sat down and thought, well, you can work this out. It's actually relatively easy to work it out with a bit of simple geometry. This really impresses people, but it's actually, this is just GCSE stuff. This is GCSE maths, folks. It's not that impressive. You've just got to plug the right numbers in. Right, so here we've got the Hubble Space Telescope. There we've got the moon. We've got the Apollo uh, lunar module, lunar excursion module, LEM. How big is it? Well, you go and look on the internet and you'll find that it's 4.2 metres across. Okay? So if you draw this out as an isosceles triangle, your base is 4.2 metres and your long sides are 385,000 kilometres, roughly. That's the you know, uh, distance between the Earth and the moon varies, but that's, that's the average, I think, and I probably rounded it up to whatever. Then what you can do is, you can work out, because, you've got, because you know this side and you know this side, you know that half of that side is 2.1 metres, and then you've got, um, let's see, um, uh, sine is uh, opposite over hypotenuse, right? So 2.1 over 385 million, I think if you go on this next slide, 2.1 over 385 million, that's the sine of theta, right? So what we're going to work out is angle theta because angle theta equates to what's called the resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope, which, is, which you can look up. So I worked out that the angle theta, or 2 theta, will be 6.26 times 10 to the minus 7 degrees, which is a very tiny, tiny little, tiny, tiny angle. But Hubble's resolving power is quoted as uh, 0.05 seconds of arc. Right, so that's 0 0.05 seconds over 3,600, because an arc is a 60th of a 60th of a degree. Okay. So uh, it's 1.389 times 10 to the minus 5 degrees. Or another source I found said that the resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope was 0 0.014 seconds of arc. So, from by comparing the the two sets of figures, you can actually work out that the lunar module is too small to be seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's about, uh, let's see, 22 times too small or 6 times too small, depending on which re resolution figure you take as being accurate. They came from university websites. So my answer was to the person that asked the question, no, the Hubble Space Teleco Telescope cannot see the Apollo craft on the moon because it doesn't have sufficient resolving power to do it. Okay. So, we, we, in other words, Hubble Space Telescope can't help us, can't, can't tell us whether, you know, we've got uh, stuff on the, the stuff on the moon, can't see the stuff. So now, uh, with great fanfare, uh, I think this came as a part of, um, because they re-announced re the new space program in 2004, I don't know if I remember this, it was announced on the 100th anniversary of powered flight uh, in 2004, and Bush did this big event and said, oh, we're going to go back to the moon, we're going to build the... Uh, Orion craft and the crew exploration vehicle and all this, that and the rest of it. 
And I think they're starting to look for supposed new landing sites. And this probe, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, was launched, I think, with that in mind. Uh, yeah, future crew missions. Blah, blah, blah. Launched 18th of June, yeah, I was right, 2009, I couldn't remember the uh, name. Uh, Cape Canaveral, blah, blah, blah. Now then, we will try to establish if the LEM can clearly be seen on the moon by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, this is a picture of the spacecraft, various things. It's meant to have a pretty good camera on it, high resolution camera. Oh dear, oh dear. Now then, if you go to nasa.gov, go to this Apollo 11 landing site uh, for Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, this is what you find. This is what you find. This is the picture that's on their website, and you can see, you can't see it because it's very small on here, but that distance is 200 meters. So that white panel there, that white rectangle, that's 200 meters on that photograph, okay? So you can work out the number of pixels that that represents on the picture. I did a little calculation. Uh, but then they also publish this enlargement. In other words, this little area here is enlarged on the NASA website to this. You guessed it, folks. Uh, that is meant to be the lunar module from Apollo 11. <laughs> really? Seriously? That's NASA's, NASA's evidence. That is on their website. You can go and look at it. Now then, let's do some calculations again. I can do maths. I can do basic maths. I have to do it for part of my degree. From one foot uh, to the other, it's 31 feet. This is a, one of the old uh, Apollo spec documents, I believe. Um, 9.5 meters. Uh, prior calculation for the Hubble Space Telescope uses the body only, so the, the um, body only calculation was this bit. But it's still only about uh, twice the distance, so it doesn't affect the Hubble calculation that I did. Um, Right, so what we've got is for 200 metres for 145 pixels, in other words, let me go back. So I measured from the NASA image, that length was 145 pixels. You know the little dots that make up a computer image, they're called pixels, picture elements. So 145 of those dots equals 200 metres on that picture, right? So this would reduce uh, the lem to 7 by 7 pixels, Right? So in other words, that thing there should be 7 by 7 pixels, basically. That, that, bl that black area should be 7 by 7, by 7 pixels on that original NASA image, right? That's what I'm on about. So you can t calculate these things. Now, I zoomed into this on that NASA image, and that, that area there, this is a little paint program, you can see here I've got images 28 by 22 pixels. So that's 25 by 25 pixels, roughly, with a margin of error. I calculated it should be 7 by 7. So this image is about three times too big. So the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter image, according to the figures that NASA give, is three times too big, according to my calculations, on that picture. Well, maybe, yeah, just splatted out. So we've got a problem here. The, the basic maths, and it's very simple stuff, it's you know, add, subtract, divide, multiply. It's not like logarithms or super long calculations. This is basic stuff, GCSE level stuff.